Hello and welcome back to Board Crazy. I am D. I am joined, as ever, by... Uh, well, I'm Will, but I guess today I am Sherlock Holmes. No, no you're not. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, yes, we were playing uh, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective today. Graham cannot join us again. If you didn't watch our review from earlier in the week, he is going to be away for at least a little bit, hopefully not too long. But for the time being, it's just Will and I, so today we're doing... Uh, God, this is bound to fail. We'll see, yeah. Unless you're playing the villain, in which case I will catch no, you. No, there is no playing the villain in this game. Uh, yeah, so we're playing Sherlock Holmes, Consulting the Detective. Oh, let's see, who's it designed consulting by? Consulting the Detective? Consulting or, Detective. No, there's no the. the Consulting Detective. No, there's no the. This game is designed by Gary Grady, Suzanne Goldberg, Raymond Edwards. Published, uh, this edition is by Asmodi and Space Cowboys. Uh, this is, I think, if I'm not mistaken, outside of House Ruled, the oldest game we've played on this channel. How old is it? Uh, this was originally published in 1981. So, wow, it's older than us. Yeah, yes, it is. By quite a few years. Uh, yeah, so, this is a detective game. So let's kind of go over all, all that we have. We have a map here with a bunch of locations and different mm. districts. We have a directory so we can find exactly where people okay, live. So do you move on the dots and I move no, on the No, we don't squares. move. No, this is not. Letters from Whitechapel. This is not Jack the Ripper, even though it's the same era. Okay, this fine. Is a Sherlock Holmes game. Uh, we have newspapers. Bunch of them. The Times. We have The Times for the date of today's case, and all previous newspapers are at our disposal. So the date is April 11th, April 11th 1890. 1890, yes. Well, how convenient that we're playing this on uh, April 11th. I wish it was April. It is not April. We also have the uh, rule book on the back here. I have this now because we have uh, informants that Sherlock Holmes uses, some uh, familiar names for fans of the detective, I don't know, the IP. Uh, we, we can reference these. Uh, Sherlock Holmes possibly. is an informant? Yeah. Well, here's the thing. In this game, you do not play as Sherlock Holmes or John Watson. You are playing as members of the Baker Street Irregulars, the street kids who sort of work for Holmes. And we are our job is to sort of try to solve this case while he is also solving this case. And at the end, we compare scores. And we'll see if we can do as well as he did, which is very difficult. We'll get to how the scoring works later. Okay. Yeah, so we have the directory, we have so the map. we're street kids. We're street kids. We are street urchins. And we have uh, the case book. In this one, we are doing case number seven, the banker's quietus. So what we'll do here is I'll just read the introduction bit. Which is just this first page, it looks like, and then once we've read this, we can start investigating leads. The Banker's Quietus? Yes. So we should make this clear that Dee has played a lot of this game. I played the first six cases. How many cases are there? Uh, ten, I believe. So, yeah. I, uh, I have not played any. No, this is new to Will, but it's pretty straightforward. You'll see how um, it works pretty quickly. Yeah, you know. So we're, gonna, we're going to investigate a number of leads, and when we feel like we've satisfactorily uh, solved it, then there will be a... There are questions at an envelope here at the back of the case book. Well, there's, there's questions here, answers in here. We'll get points for how many answers we get correct, and then we will subtract five points for every extra lead that it took us uh, compared to Holmes. So he's usually quite efficient, usually like, you know, four or five leads at most. So if we do like 10 plus, we're gonna be losing a bunch of points. So we want to be quick here. Well, don't worry, Dee. I'm good at working the corner. All right, so let's get this done. Okay. The world's first consulting detective, Sherlock Holmes, turns from the fire where he has restored some measure of warmth to his hands and comes to his seat before his morning breakfast. Sitting with us around the table are Inspector Lestrade and Dr. Watson. Well, Lestrade, what brings you to our humble abode on this cold, windy morning? An ill wind, I presume? You presume correctly, Mr. Holmes. Murder. Ah, indeed. Who was the victim, and what are the details? The victim was one Oswald Mason, chief accountant for the Bank of England. Ooh. He was found murdered at his home at 10 o'clock last evening by his wife upon her return from an evening out. He seems to have been a simple, hard-working man, leading a quiet and unassuming life, and on the surface, there seems to be no motive for the murder. Well, Lestrade, I don't think you came out on a morning like this just to tell me that you have a murder with no motive. I can't believe that Scotland Yard has exhausted all its resources and must now turn to me. Lestrade does not immediately respond. He keeps his dark eyes focused on the plate of kippers in the center of the table. After a moment, he raises his eyes and looks at Holmes. You're right, Mr. Holmes. I think it's premature. But I am here at the request of the exchequer. Oh, that's a fun word. 
It seems that Mr. Mason was doing some work for the Treasury, and the Chancellor wants to make sure that Mason's death has nothing to do with the work he was involved in. Do you have any evidence that the murder was related to the Treasury matter? No, none whatsoever. I tried to convince the Chancellor that unless some new evidence turns up, it looks as if Mason's death is just another commonplace murder that I am sure the Yard can solve. I am sure, Lestrade, but as you, have said, as you have said, and depend upon it, there is nothing so unnatural as the commonplace. Right at the moment, I am finishing up a vexatious puzzle, so maybe my friends here will be able to look into the matter until I am free. Okay. Vexatious, huh? Vexatious. 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 Oh, we've got my handy dandy notebook. Will, you also have one there? Uh, no so, pad. No right. pad. I don't use books. No, you don't. I don't like books. You don't, no, you're not a book person. Read. All right, so I'm just going to write down a few details here. Uh, Oswald Mason, chief accountant of the Bank of England. So I have actually taken the liberty of reading through the bits of the newspaper before we got started. There is a bit here about the murder will. If you want a quick read over that, maybe there's some details in there that we did not get from Lestrade. So according to this, a murder was committed in Bloomsbury last night, shortly after 10 p.m. Constable Lane, I'm guessing that's the, the name of the constable and not the name of the road. That seems likely, because the road is coming up, I believe, there. <laughs> it's just like, no, uh, it says Constable Lane, uh, let's see, entered the home at 42 Tottenham Court Road. He was killed by a blow to the head. It was discovered by his wife upon her return to their home around 10 p.m. The police report only that the intruder apparently entered by an upstairs window. And judging by the disarray of the study, a struggle occurred in which he was killed, <sighs> Mr. Mason. You know, the cops are on the case. His wife's name is Rose, and he has a brother named Cecil, or Cecil, depending on how you pronounce that. I Cecil. Well, here's the thing. So there may have been a struggle, but there was also this uh, thing in here about uh, he was doing some work for the Treasury. Now, I don't know. It's possible that there wasn't a struggle, but someone was just looking around for something, possibly, some documents. Ruffling through his crap? Yeah. Or Turning they the were over. trying to steal something specific, and they turned the place over to make it look like it was just like, you know, a bunch of idiots looking for something, and I don't know. Yeah, for that. And cover up their tracks, and then he walked in on them, and then they bumped him on the head with something heavy. So we don't need to know about the yellow fever epidemic in Jacksonville, Florida. Probably not. I mean, that might come up in a future Indeed. case. Seven deaths in 24 hours. Really? Yeah. That's bad for Jacksonville. Okay. They'll what about recover. this new sheep? I, I mean, There's a new sheep? There's new sheep. Oh, yeah? The pioneer of husbandry reports cool. to have yielded a new species of sheep which produces superior mutton on a diet of clover. Hmm. So, I'm, I mean, that seems as pertinent as anything I can think of to the murder of, a, of a, an accountant. Also, if you cannot tell, we are playing this game in a sauna right now. Yeah. I uh, just watered the rocks. We basically are steam. playing this game in a sauna. Uh, it would probably be wise to investigate his home. Yeah? I mean, that's kind of ridiculous. Okay. So let's go there. Uh, so, what's the name again? Oswald Mason. So we'll look up Mason. Oswald Mason is at 42 West Central. So what we just simply do is go to 42 West Central in the book here and then read. So 42 West Central would be where on the map? Oh, it doesn't really matter. Let's see it, though. I want to know where he lives. So West Central is here, 42. There's 44, 40, 42. So he lived... Right here, for people who want to know. Uh-huh. Where's Evanson & Co.'s gift shop? Oh, uh... Is that anywhere nearby? There. So, I mean, it's not far it's away. It's not that far. It's... There's a break in there at Evanson & Co. gift shop. Wednesday night. Okay. The door was forced open. Nothing appears to have been stolen. The safe in the office had not been tampered with. Okay. That's weird. That may be relevant. Just keep it in mind. You can write it down on your pad if you want. I'm not going to do that, but... Let's read about... Why would they break into a gift shop and not steal any gifts? <laughs> Makes no sense, Dee. Uh, wrong the case. They got the wrong place. All right. Uh, all right. So 42 West Central. Constable Parks on duty at the Mason House. Actually, I should, let me write it down. Uh, all right. So, let's continue. Constable Parks on duty at the Mason House shows us the study, the scene of the crime. We find the study in shambles. The office chair has fallen back and all elements which were on the desk are scattered on the ground. The inkwell has spilled its contents on the carpet and the stain has extended to a book which was apparently on the desk. The knickknacks from the commode have also been knocked over, but the furniture from the back of the room is intact. 
At the foot of the window, we also find the fragments of a completely destroyed plaster statuette. Hmm. Wiggins is near the window, a magnifying glass in hand, examining the window sill. There's a palm print here on the windowsill. It looks like it was left in a residue of plaster dust, says Wiggins, as he replaces the magna his magnifying glass in his coat pocket. Where was the body found, Parks? It was sprawled across the desks. You can see the uh, blood stain on the top. The blighter put up quite a fight, I must say. And the blighter? The blighter. How was he killed? He was bashed, his head was bashed in by a statue. It was sent over to the lab for old Murray to look at. Is there any indication of how the murderer got into the house? It looks as if he entered by the upstairs window. It was found open and it shows signs of forced entry. Who found the body? His wife. She said she was at her weekly whist game at the West End Social Club. She arrived home around 10 o'clock and found her husband dead. Did she see anyone in or around the house? She said sh she saw and heard nothing. Is the room as she found it? Yes, she said that as soon as she saw her husband lying sprawled across the desk, she ran outside for help. Constable Lane came at the sound of her cries and took charge. The only things that were removed were the body, which was taken to Bart's, and some of Mr. Mason's papers, which were taken to Scotland Yard. Oh, yes, and the statue, which was sent to the criminology lab. And where is Mrs. Mason? She was in a state of shock and was taken to her sister, Mrs. Edward Farmer. Okay. Um, Here's what I want to know. Mm -hmm. The plaster statue that was ruined. It's the murder weapon, apparently. No, I thought there was a different statue that was the murder weapon. If there were pieces of plaster, wouldn't that be... His head was bashed in by a... St oh. And here's what I want to know. Where did they get that plaster statue? Probably. Was it a gimmicky, cheap statue, maybe purchased at a gift shop a few blocks away? Mm -hmm. I think you're maybe getting too caught Maybe up on this gift shop. Edmondson I mean, and Co. has everything to do with this case, Steve. Completely destroyed plaster statue. Okay, you're right, so. What if there was something in the statue? Well, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking What of, if Edmondson and Co. is dealing drugs and they hide the drugs in okay. <laughs> plaster statues? So someone broke in to steal a plaster statue from Edmondson and Co. Uh -huh. but it wasn't there because they accidentally sold it. The, the cashier accidentally sold it. Mm-hmm. To the this Mr. Mason guy, okay, he Will? takes it home. Someone finds out he has Will? it. They looked at the records, and then they kill him and they steal it. Let's maybe let's maybe ignore the gift shop for the time being, okay? But what about the new sheep? I, I don't think the sheep are involved yet. They might come up. I'm convinced that the gift shop. Now the is. idea that there might have been something in the statuette though did come to mind. Now they haven't really. I don't think they've really referenced specific like Sherlock Holmes stories. In the cases I've played so far, but that would be very similar to like the Six Napoleons, where there were a bunch of statues and one of them had contraband in it, basically. Uh, what if the statue that they broke yeah. had a different, harder statue inside? And that was, and the, that murder was the murder that weapon. That seems unlikely. <laughs> the killer was like, wait, I gotta get to the hard statue. He smashed the outer uh -huh. statue to get yeah. to the inner statue. Get the hard shell. Yes. Um, I'm gonna say no. I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually consider the possibility that there was something in the statuette. That seems possible. I think likely. Why else did you break it? I think it, a key to being good at this game is not making any assumptions. Let's only use the evidence we have, okay? I mean, well, maybe, maybe It not. wasn't his wife. He could have been hit by, from behind. Or, well, we should maybe investigate the, the, the corpse and see what the coroner has to say about yeah. it. Well, it's, I just don't think it's the wife, because I know one thing I know about murder is that it's almost never the spouse. When someone's killed. This seems very complicated if it were the wife. All right, so that's, I think we've got everything we need to know. Now it's just a matter of where do we want to go next. I feel like one of the informants is probably a wise choice here. Uh, the papers are at Scotland Yard. The murder weapon is at, with Murray, and then the body is at Bart. Uh, what do you think? I, I'm thinking the body, personally. Let's go to the body. Okay, so that's at Bart's. What's Bart's? So we're going to 38 East Central, which is... Boom. Mm -hmm. Okay. North of the Thames. Jasper looks up from the report he is writing as we enter. Hello, come in. If you keep company with Holmes much longer, I think you'll soon know more about criminology than I do. How can I help you? We're investigating the death of Oswald Mason. Have you done the autopsy, doctor? Yes, I did it first thing this morning. I was just finishing the report. Let's see. The body of Oswald Mason arrived at the hospital at half past midnight. The 11th of April. Oh, it's today. Right. Okay. 
Uh, the deceased was in his early 40s in good health before he was killed. Death was caused by a blow to the side of the head by a heavy blunt object. Death probably occurred in a matter of a very few minutes. Blood found on his knuckles and under his fingernails was of a different type than his own. Sir Jasper lays the paper aside and looks up. Nothing very exciting or informative, I'm afraid. Thanks anyway, anytime, and good luck. Okay, so, didn't tell us much, but we do know that there was definitely a fight. Either that... Or perhaps Mr. Mason was a member of a bare knuckle boxing ring we didn't know about. Good point. I'm gonna write that we down. have to assume anything. And that he was a you know early forties and in good health, so presumably physically fit to some degree enough to you know if so if someone were to overpower him in a fight. I'm in my early forties and in li- good health. Do I look you're physically not, fit? You're neither in your forties nor in good health. Okay, <laughs> fine. All right, well, that's a bad lead, but, you know, it I happens. told you the papers. All right, find the papers. Where's Scotland Yard, Will? It happens. has to go all the way. Right, that's, it really doesn't matter where, where they are. There. You're wasting Somewhere. your time. Look at the map. Okay, 13 Southwest. Inspector Tobias Gregson, a tall, white-faced, flaxen-haired man, or sees us in his office. I understand that you are helping Holmes in this matter. I, uh, well, I must say that Holmes has given me enough helps in the past, so I will try to answer your questions. Thank you. Would you please fill us in on what your investigation has turned up so far? Gladly. Though there isn't much, we have determined that entry was made through the upstairs bedroom window. We found foot marks in the flower bed by the back porch and paint scraped off the porch column, indicating that the intruder climbed to the roof and the bedroom window. And the bedroom window. There are marks on the window where it was forced. Uh, we then assume that he made his way downstairs, thinking the house was empty. When he opened the study door, he came face to face with Mr. Mason. Okay, so the study is downstairs. Mm-hmm. I mean, we didn't know that originally. I don't think. Uh, okay. And a fight ensued that ended in Mason's death. The murderer panicked and fled through the study window. All right, so they went back through the study window. That is assumed. Was anything taken? Was there anything worth taking? Well, according to Mrs. Mason, nothing was taken. It is true that she is still very upset, but she did an inventory of her jewelry, which was in in the bedroom, and said it was all accounted for. There were some very valuable pieces, family heirlooms. Uh, As far as we can tell, their room wasn't even searched. What about the rest of the house? Nothing taken, nothing of anything great value, some silver, a stamp collection, but all in order. What about the government papers that Mason was working on that night? Yes, that was our first thought. As for the papers themselves, they seem to be all accounted for. They were found scattered around the room. We assume that they were scattered during the fight. We sent the papers to the Treasury, and I have just heard from them that all the papers are in order. Of course, we have not eliminated the possibility that his work was... that his work for the Treasury was the reason for the murder. Okay, so we know that they climbed to the roof and then broke into the window. Why not just go into the study window? And all the other papers are accounted for. I think we need to see those papers, but... I don't. I don't think we do. Here's the thing. What the hell? We don't until we know what he was doing for his work. How are we supposed to figure out what the possible motive was for the killing? And then if we don't know what the motive is, D, then we can't ever figure out who actually. The papers it. are not important at this point. I would say if anything, we could go directly to the Treasury or the Bank of England and see what, what that was about. But let's see. Let me, okay, I'm gonna, we should not focus too much on the informants. Uh, let's focus. Let's get back on to stuff we know. Maybe we should talk to his brother Cecil. What do you say? And, all right, but I'll rough him up a bit, and then you. I say we go talk to Mycroft. I don't think we should talk to Mycroft. I really fine. think you're. I just oh, fine. Martin Freeman then. D. Hmm. We need to know what he was up to. Okay. Want to go to the, want to go to the, the the bank then? I don't think who would kill their own brother. I mean, it seems ridiculous. <laughs> it's over here. It's close to the hospital where the body is. Right next to the stock exchange. Means nothing. Mr. Ned Kimball, the chief cashier of the bank, receives us in his office. We find him behind a massive desk, which does his large frame justice. As we reckon his bulk to be well over 15 stones in weight. The silver-haired Kimball greets us affably, though he speaks with gravity and a shake of his head at the tragedy of Mason's murder. I just can't imagine why anyone would want to do such a thing. He was certainly well-liked by all of his fellow workers here at the bank. How long has he been with the Bank of England? He started with us more than 15 years ago. He has always been one of our most trusted and valued employees. Five years ago, he was enthusiastically approved as a choice for chief accountant despite his relative youth. As you may know, the bank is controlled by its directors, but they have little to do with the day-to-day operation of business. That is my responsibility. Mason was my second-in-command. 
Was he ever involved in any controversy or quarrel over bank business of which you are aware? Most certainly not. As I said, he was well-liked and did his job superbly. What do you know about his work with the Treasury? Very little. One of our responsibilities is to oversee government audits. This was Oswald's area of responsibility. This work is highly confidential. You will have to talk to the governor, Lionel Foxcroft, if you have questions about this. I'm sorry, that's all I know. Would you object to our checking out his office? No, I suppose that would be acceptable. I thought that Mason's secretary, Mrs. Mabel Brown, would be the best person to sort through his papers, but as she reported in Ill today, nothing has been done in that regard. Could you give us a list of the members of Mason's staff? Yes, I would be glad to. None of them are here right now, as I gave them the day off. He takes the pen out of his inkwell and begins to write. If I can give you any further assistance, please let me know. With these words, he hands us the following list and shows us the door. Richard Cates, Mason's assistant. Mrs. Miss Joanna Bailey, head clerk, or Clark, I guess since we're in England. Mrs. Mabel Brown, Mason's secretary. And a check of Mason's desk reveals the following items. Yeah. Evanson and Co. Oh! Are you kidding me? Oh my God! Are you kidding me? Sta I am the best detective in the history of man. Right there. Statues. Uh -huh. Two to five pounds, it looks like. Paid today, March 31st, 1890. So like... 11, 10 days prior. Mm-hmm. Aberdeen, Greece tickets, 421. I guess they were heading, he was going to, he drew, withdrew the 240 pounds there. Mm-hmm. And then Mrs. Kempfield? Romana? Eighth of, I don't know what that says. I'm not really good with cursive. And what happened at the, so there was a break-in at the gift shop. There was a break-in on... Um, you thought I was crazy. I, you were. It was Wednesday night. This is Friday. So it happened on the 9th. Uh, the lock on the back door had been forced open, but nothing was stolen. Mm -hmm. And the safe had not been tampered with. Somebody was looking for the statue. Probably. Thursday, April 10th, though, the day he was murdered... He had this um, meeting, presumably, with this Mr. Kempfield. Let's find out what this Kempfield has to say and how he's connected to Evanson and Co. Yes, I am. Michael Kempfield, what can I do for you? We are investigating the murder of Oswald Mason. Did you see him recently? Isn't that terrible? I was so shocked by the news. Yes, I saw Ozzy just yesterday. We had a late lunch together. Why? Did he say anything which might have indicated that he was worried or that he feared for his life? No, nothing at all. I thought the police suspected a burglar. Why would anyone want to murder Oswald? The police do suspect a burglar, but we have to check out every angle. Did you see each other often? Is there anything at all that you can tell us? We got together much less often than either of us wished. We were friends at school and have maintained that friendship for over 20 years. Ozzy didn't seem worried at all yesterday. He was looking forward to finishing a project at work and taking Rose to Greece. It's always so hard to see someone one day, a, a, a vital, alive person, to realize the next that they are gone. How is Rose taking all this? I really must call on her. She is currently resting at her sister-in-law, sister and in-law, Edward Farmer. Thank you for your help, Mr. Kenfield. If you let us know, if you think of anything which might help anything at all, please let us know. Okay. Yeah, we really pressed him for information. Uh, Jeez. Well, he's just a friend. Okay, let's 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 put some stuff together here. He's working for the treasury. Mm-hmm. He got statues. Like I said, if he was hiding an important document related to his treasury work inside the plaster statue, mm -hmm. that would, you know, that would tie some things together. Now, it's a, it's a matter at this point to figure out who has a motive here. Well, we, if we figure, I, I imagine if we visit Evanson, they'll tell us that, that he had a specific kind of statue commissioned. Yes. That's what they'll tell us. Uh, so we don't need to know that because we already kind of figured that out. Okay, well, so let's, let's consider who we could investigate next. His brother, his wife, and we got these people he works with. His assistant, Richard Cates. No, Lionel Foxcroft. All right, who's Foxcroft again? He's the governor that is okay. working directly with him in the treasury. He will probably not tell us anything, though. Well, I assume not. Most likely it would be an assistant or something that would, have, would be more willing to talk. Someone closer to him. Let's go talk to Richard. Richard Cates. Let's go talk to Richard Cates. 
A young, well-groomed Richard Cates invites us in after we introduce ourselves. I really don't know what I can tell you. Mr. Mason was always a perfect gentleman and was truly well-liked at the bank. Can you tell us anything about work? The work that he had taken home yesterday? No, I'm afraid not. I sometimes work very closely with him on projects, but in this case, he was handling it all himself. He had turned over much of the routine work to me, encouraging me to take responsibility and make decisions. But I know nothing more of that except... Other than, more than that, then, he was working directly for the Chancellor of the Exchequer on this highly confidential project. Maybe Mr. Perhaps Mr. Kimball could tell you more. Didn't we already talk to Ned Kimball? Yes, we did. So we need to talk to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. <sighs> this is bad. Lionel Foxcroft, then. Yep. All right, Lionel Foxcroft. Lionel Foxcroft, Governor of the Bank of England, stands in front of his office window looking into the courtyard and out... At our entrance, he turns and addresses us. Please sit down. I understand that you are looking into Oswald's death. I will give you all the help I can. What is it that you want to know? Well, the obvious question is who killed Oswald Mason? I wish I knew. He was a good man, and I can't imagine anyone who would want to murder Oswald. We had great hope for him here at the bank. We understand that Mr. Mason was working on a special assignment at the Treasury. Yes, he was. Could there be any connection between Mason's assignment and the, at the Treasury and his murder? Mm, I wouldn't think so. Great sums of money were involved, it's true, but I don't think there's any connection. Very few people knew of Mason's involvement in the investigation. No reason that they should. Who knew? Well, to my knowledge, there were only three people who knew at what he was working on for the Treasury. Sir Adrian Malmquist at the Treasury. Richard Cates, we've already investigated it himself. Okay, Richard Malmquist. No, Adrian Malmquist. Adrian Malmquist. We still haven't talked to the wife. No, we haven't. She probably also would have had some knowledge of this, presumably. But, I mean, th there's no reason to think she's guilty here. There's no reason or to even, think Cecil Or is. even involved. We can't go for... The, we don't... We Cecil could have known, though, and who knows what his deal is. We don't know anything about him yet. What is Cecil's deal? I don't know. It's Cecil. I don't think Cecil's going to be our guy. What the heck is... Oh, he's over here. He lives in a Draycott place. Ugh. I would like nothing more than to be able to assist in the identification of my brother's assailant. However, I, I doubt that I know anything of importance in this case. We have always been very close, and he did indicate that he feared for his safety. Do you know anything about his work for the Treasury? He has spoken on the matter in very general terms. I know only that it involved some irregularities in certain government accounts. We should have gone to him first. That would have been useful. Okay, Cecil Mason allows a faint smile to show itself for the first time during our interview. What a cruel mistress is fate. Oswald had planned a trip for himself in a rose. He was to have surprised her with the tickets at a small family celebration this weekend. He had so enjoyed baffling Rose with no hint of a gift other than the Venus de Milo replica. I am glad he confided in me so that no doubt could possibly remain on the subject. Okay. So that's why he bought the statue. Well, he bought two statues. So he bought one replica, and he bought another one. If we go right to Mom Quist, we okay. can find out. Okay. Well, yeah. I think it's... We know what the statues are, guy. We figured this out. All right? Devinson and Co. 12 Southwest. It's right here. 12 Southwest. I found it. Great job. Here you go. Sir Adrian Mom Quist. Knight of the Order of the Garter. Oh, good Lord. Knights Commander of the Order of the Bath, Undersecretary of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, <laughs> enters the conference room where we have been kept waiting for the last 20 minutes. He is imposing in person as he is portrayed to be in newspapers. At 39, he is one of the youngest members of the present government. He is tall, aristocratic and bearing, and moves and talks with great energy. Sorry for keeping you waiting, but my meeting with the Chancellor ran longer than expected. There is my whole day schedule off. This won't take long, will it? Well, we, the Chancellor... Asked me to give you all the help I could, interrupts Sir Adrian as he paces up and down the room. I only met the fellow five or six times. Capable fellow, very capable. Damned inconvenient, this murder. Damned inconvenient. Well, uh, what we, uh, Mason was to hand me over to report about irregularities. So far, the loyal opposition hasn't gotten wind of the affair, and it is important that they don't until we have cleared it up and have apprehended the culprit. I assured the Chancellor that the matter would be concluded this week. Bloody inconvenient. Could we... We'd get someone to replace Mason. Do you have any idea who murdered Mason? Has it anything to do with his work here? That's what... I must get... Please, Sir Adrian, if you would just answer a few questions, we may be able to throw some light on this matter. First, do you feel that Mason's death might have anything to do with his work at the Treasury? 
I wish I could answer that. I never expected it. There is no question that the investigation dealt with some large sums of money, but murder just doesn't fit. It won't stop the investigation, just delay it. The papers that Mason was working on are all accounted for, but again, we had copies of all the important papers in our files. So taking them would not have stopped the investigation or saved the culprit. That brings us to the next question. Do you have any suspicions as to who the guilty party might be? No, I do not. Great. You must understand that the investigation has come from the outside. The findings must be above reproach with no question of political advantage. That is why I have stayed out of the investigation. All I can do is give you what facts I have. That would be a good start. For the first time since he entered the room, Sir Adrian sits and faces us across the conference table. Here are the facts. As you know, the Exchequer is responsible for all financial business. I should say that the financial well-being of the Empire... Uh, this year we were responsible for the distribution of some 600 million pounds, a large sum to keep check of, but we must. Six months ago, it came, into, it came to the government's attention that Bacon & Company, one of, the London, one of London's largest investment houses, was in financial straits. Their difficulties had arisen because of their extensive commitments in South America, where political unrest, commercial instability, and the often irresponsible financial policies of various republics have made any form of investment highly speculative. The firm is solvent, but it is not in possession of sufficient liquid assets to meet its current liabilities. South American politics feature largely in the story. Bacon's dealings were with the foreign offices, the National Bank of Uruguay, and the Buenos Aires Railways, and several other such enterprises. Hold on, before we keep reading, let's take stock of what we've learned so far. Uh, Bacon and Company was the company, well, that was the bank, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, they were, yeah, we found. That's where he withdrew. He had a withdrawal slip from them. I feel like we finally hit the home stretch here. Very early on, when the storm was brewing and it was known that in the innermost city circles that the Bacon's position was insecure, the government of the Bank of England, the governor of the Bank of England, Lionel Foxcroft had inquired on, of the chancellor whether the Argentine government might not be persuaded to deal in some other way with the enormous bulk of discredited South American securities than weighing down the London stock market. The interest rates have been at 5% since the first of the year. If the market had to assume Bacon's losses, the interest rate might rise to 6% or even higher. Well, you know what that means. Not really, can you tell? Uh, that's what I'm trying to do, says Malmquist as he squirms impatiently in his chair. To make a long story short, Her Majesty's government and the Bank of England have guaranteed to cover the discredited securities held by Bacon and Company and their investors. An audit of Bacon's books showed short-term liabilities totaling 3.25 million pounds, a reasonable price to pay for long-term stabilization of the economy. Sounds good to us. We nod in agreement with Wiggins' concession. Yes, except for one problem. So far, we have redeemed 4.57 million pounds worth of securities. If the opposition finds out, we could end up being the opposition next year. We'll save their bacon, but, but damn if they'll profit by it. Momquist pushes back his chair, removes a gold watch from his pocket, and opens it. Well, that's all the time I have. Any help you can give us will be greatly appreciated. Good day. What are we looking for? 1.32 million pounds, what else? The difference between the audit, what the audit showed on Bacon's books and the securities that have been redeemed. Where did these securities come from? Damn it, that's what Mason was to tell me. Sir Adrian bolts out of his chair, bloody inconvenient. I certainly hope Holmes will apply his considerable talents to this matter. I'm sure Mr. Holmes will be interested in this matter if it has thrown some light, if it will throw some light on Mr. Mason's death. Yes, of course, we are all considered with solving Mason's murder. Concerned with solving Mr. Mason's murder. If we can solve the murder and clear up this matter at the same time, so much the better. Good day. Okay. You cannot hide over a million pounds in a statue. Well, you could if it's on a note. Or if it was exchanged for stones, like gems. Something smaller and lighter. Not, not likely. A million dollars? Like a million pounds worth of gems? Good lord, back then? All right, so an audit showed liabilities totaling... 3.25 million pounds. Except they paid out 4.57 million mm -hmm. pounds. Which means that someone was releasing the securities at the tre treasury, someone from the treasury was overpaying. 
and they were skimming the difference. And I'm guessing what's his name found that. Mason. But they. But here's the yeah. thing: is that Mason not only did he find it because obviously this guy knows about it, Monkus knows about it, mm-hmm. but Mason must have had Mason must have figured out who specifically did it, and that's why he's dead. I will say that they went out of their way to point out that Monquist is 39 years old and tall. And, like, imposing. Yeah, and he moves fast and he's sort of erratic. But why would he volunteer this information to us? The only people who knew about this were the governor, Monquist, Cates, and then Mason himself. No, what, 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 what would Cates' involvement be? He, Fox Prof was taking the money. The hotel is, the, is probably the right way to go here. Let's go to the hotel and see... Uh, see if, if someone there remembers who Mason, if if Mason was there with anyone. Dead end. We're doing Marshall Guilfoyle, manager, says he used a conference room for business meetings. So he had a business meeting in there. Great. That's what was the business meeting about? Tells us nothing. That's terrible. This is, I think, the worst I've ever done so far, Will. Yeah, well, that's because you suck. All right, we're gonna, we've got to talk to the one. I've got you over here. Do we? Well, who else would know anything? Maybe he told her something. It feels like an oversight. Like, real-life detectives would be like, we're not going to talk to the closest person he, to him. We're going to just skip over everyone else. Where else would we go from here, D? Other than just making a blind accusation. Make a call. We're going to go to the gift shop. All right. What is it called? Evanson & Co. Seriously? I'm going to say I only said it like 3,000 times. Evanson & Co. We introduce ourselves to him. He says, we're, we tell him that we're looking into the murder of Mr. Oswald Mason. We believe that he purchased one or more items shortly before he died. Can you tell us what he purchased from you? Oh, yes, here it is. He consults us. He bought two reproductions of the Venus de Milo statue from J. J Small and C.A. Whatever, I don't know. We delivered them for him. So he didn't get them from them. They just, they just were the importer. They brought them in. Where were they delivered? They were shipped separately to Mr. Uh, one to Mrs. Rose Mason at their home, and another to Mabel Brown of Forty Devonshire. Dep- yeah, she doesn't live in the city, so she's not. Those statues have certainly proved to be good sellers. I sold the remaining three to another gentleman Wednesday. I surely hope that I will be able to get more from the manufacturer. And who might that be? J. Small and Company. Thank you very much, Mr. Dockauer. You've been most helpful. And he says, not at all. We need to find this Mabel Brown. She lives in Devonshire. So we go to Devonshire. It's a different county. So we go to a different county. We can't. You have to stay in London in this game. Devonshire. Yeah, let's look up, let's look up the, the 40s, I guess, and see if we find a Devonshire. 40 Devonshire. Northwest. Okay. Oh, wait. Is that James Brown? I think that is James Brown. No, it's Sam Brown. Okay. We are met at the door of Miss Brown's lodgings by her landlady, Mrs. Quinn. After introducing ourselves, we inquire if Mrs. Brown is in. Yes, she is. Poor dear, I've been so worried about her. She hasn't eaten in days, and she didn't go into work today. They were having an affair. Uh, has she been with you long? Close to three years, ever since she married Sam. It's just been hard on her. Sam being gone so much, he's a merchant seaman with Jardines, you know? Mm. Ah, uh, no, we didn't know. Have you known him long? He, oh, yes. Uh, ever since he was a baby, Martha, God rest her soul, was my dearest friend. Sam was like a son to me. Almost ten years now. Uh, where does the time go? Here we are. This is the door of Mabel's room. Mabel, dear, there are some people here to see you about poor Mr. Mason's death. I'll be right there. <laughs> Comes the door. A voice from behind the door. Uh, a young woman in her early 20s opens the door. She has flowing black hair, which emphasizes the delicate beauty of her ivory complexion. Please come in. If you need anything, dear, just ring, says Mrs. Quinn, who has already headed, started to head back downstairs. How can I help you, Miss Mabel Brown asks. Um, we understand that you've heard of Mr. Mason's death. Yes, this morning. Joanna, Miss Bailey, from the office, stopped by and told me the news. Ned, Mr. Kimball, gave her the day off, and she stopped by to tell me. How did you know Mr. Mason? Sec- she's been his secretary for three years, ever since uh, her graduation from Bedford. Okay, cool. Do you know any reason why anyone would want to murder Mr. Mason? Oh, no, he was such a nice man. So considerate. Always remembering everyone's birthday. Last week, he gave me a lovely little statue. At this point, the tears she has been trying to hold back begin to trickle down her cheeks. I might have been wrong about the affair. Seems like he was just a nice guy. 
Uh, Joanna woke me this morning and told me Mr. Mason's death. As we were uh, talking, I turned and saw the broken Venus mm. on the floor. And it struck me as so sad. With this, she breaks into loud sobs. I am sorry. That's all right. We understand. We have to... We are sorry to have to... In- to have to intrude at this time, but we have to check with everyone who might have shed some light on this tragedy. I want to help. Please go on. Do you know anyone at the bank who might uh, have wished harm on Mr. Mason or anyone involving his work that would lead to his murder? No. As I said before, he was very considerate of everyone. He was very well liked. Uh, His work was mainly routine and concerned primarily with the operation of bank audits. He has been involved of late with some work for the Treasury, but I know little of that. Mr. Cates might know more, but he often did work for government agencies. No, there's nothing I can think of that would cause such a consequence. Well, thank you for your help. We hope that we hope you'll be feeling better. Thank you. I'll ring for Mrs. Quinn to show you out. And then we meet with Mrs. Quinn. She leads us down the stairs. And she says, I hope Mabel isn't in any trouble. No, not at all. Just routine. Uh, she's had so many problems of late. She and Sam's always fighting when he is home and then being gone for such long periods of time. A hard life for both of them. I heard her crying last night after she came in. Uh, I should have tried to comfort her, but I was already in bed. Life is hard. Well, have a good day. This Her husband seems like a potential suspect. Mm-hmm. That's my thought. So he sees the statue, right? Mm-hmm. Thinks that she's cheating on him. Breaks it out of a fit of rage. Mm-hmm. Goes to the guy's house who got it for her. Sees the same statue mm-hmm. and breaks it because it reminds him. Yep. That might be it. It might, it might actually have nothing to do with the treasury whatsoever. Yeah. This guy just killed this other guy in a fit of jealous rage. That's it. Misplaced jealous rage. So it's Sam. Sam Brown. Brown is the killer. That's. I think that sounds reasonable. I mean, we could go talk to him. No, we can't. We we're just... at his house. He's probably like at sea or something. Unless he might, he might be at uh, who do you work for? Jardines. But I don't want to necessarily waste time. Waste more leads and five more points because we've definitely taken... We've done it, D. Go to the envelope. Go to the questions at the back. Nothing was stolen. Wait, 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 wait. wait. One last thing, though. Mm -hmm. Evanson and Co. was broken into. Mm -hmm. They were trying to get the information. He was... He found the statue. Probably had the name of the... Like, or he found out where it was delivered from, but he didn't know who who got it to her. So he went to the shop, broke in... Yes. ...and got the info. Boom. Okay. That's it. Okay. Emerson and Co. Uh-oh. One, who killed Oswald Mason? Uh-oh. What? I am premature here. Well, let's give it a try. Who killed Oswald Mason? We're going to say Sam Brown? Yes. Two, uh, jealousy? Yes. Three, now what did the Venus de Milo rep- reproductions contain? Nothing. And who stole the five sisters and who was the murderers? I think we were way off, probably. It's not Sam Brown, is it? Well, it still might have been, but I mean, it doesn't matter. We were already so many leads in. Uh, let's. We can still guess. I, I mean, it's not unreasonable to think that the Venus de Milo had something to do. Still had something to do with the. Uh, yeah, I mean, evidence of the. Probably like maybe like a billing evidence that shows evidence like of the evidence of the paying. missing money. Yeah. Four. Who stole the five sisters? What are the five sisters? I wonder. I mean, the, like the, the the statues. Yeah, he said there were two that were purchased, and then three more mm-hmm. at the shop. So those are the five sisters. These statues were imported. We needed to go to the import company. They were smuggling crap in them. Someone came to take them back, and that's why they were broken. Yep. And the five is who was the murderer's accomplice? God, we were way off on this. See, you suck at this game. Yeah, this is going to be my worst score ever. Even in the ones I've gotten like low scores on, usually it's because I've taken too many leads but gotten the answers right. This, I think we're going to be completely off. Wait, we're not allowed to go back and keep investigating? No. Questions? No. Oh. All right, so what they can... Oh, who stole the five sisters? Let's take a guess. Can't feel in Kate's. I think Kate's, Kate's was the accomplice? Yeah. Why not? Six. Who was responsible for the sh- shortage of funds at Bacon & Company? We never even went to them. No. We don't know any of their employees. No. Mason. Mason. We're going to say he Mason did it. himself? Yeah. Let's say that he was a part of the scheme. He was part of the scheme, and then they, he, it was good this that he was... A, he we're going to get none of these right. It was good that he was part of the investigation because he could cover it up. What was the distinctive sign of murders ordered by Moriarty? <laughs> Apparently Moriarty is involved in this. He was involved in a previous one, which I actually put the dots together there and was pretty proud of myself. This one, who knew? 
Uh, well, I was thinking about the office. It was the state of the office. The body laid over the desk. It probably is not blunt force trauma. I don't think that's Moriarty's M.O. Wasn't there furniture in, in the room that was just left completely intact? I have no... I didn't think I'm, what was found in the body of Jonathan Small, Will? In the body. In the body of Jonathan Small. Oh. It's possible. Now we... Hold on. We, this is unusual. They read 37 Southeast Waterloo Station before proceeding to the solution. So we're going to do that. Constable Parks is standing at the entrance of the station. He recognizes us as we get out of the handsome... You're a little late, mates. Just missed all the excitement. Mr. Holmes and Inspector Lestrade just left with two reluctant companions. A young man and woman, they were. And what a howl that woman put up. She was sure upset she was. The young man tried to make a run for it, but only got as far as the waiting arms of Dr. Watson. So the you man want to say it's Mabel and... Maybe it's Mabel and her husband. Could be. The answers! He was murdered by someone called Errol Hawk, <laughs> who we did not even find... Part two. Well, you put it up here so I can see it. Uh, he surprised Mason. Uh, he was killed because he surprised Mason while attempting to steal the Athena statue. We got that way wrong. Yep. Uh, precious jewels stolen from the jeweler DeVry. DeVry? Didn't I not say that there could be jewels in the statue? Yeah. Uh, four, Nat Cook and Jonathan Small. There's Jonathan Small. Five, Violet Blue. Nope. Part two, Michael, Michael Essex and Mitchell York, directors of Bacon and Company. We should have gone to Bacon. Seven mm -hmm. was a Roman coin. And eight, trace of arsenic, probably administered by his wife. So we got zero points. Uh, and did make Holmes seven leads in this case, which is more than usual. It took us 12, so that's uh, minus 25. We got nothing. Minus we 25 we points. We would have arrested the wrong people. <laughs> what is that good? That's horrible. Let's learn what happened. There might be some like an older newspapers we should have referenced. Well, well, here are our friends now, Lestrade, says Holmes, as he and Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard stand flanking Errol Hawk and Violet Blue just in front of the barrier at Waterloo Station. It was a pretty problem, as my instincts told me this morning. Hawk here, for all his personal fastidiousness, was a most untidy thief and a brutal murderer. Errol Hawk succumbed to the lure of the DeVry diamond uh, from... Or DeVry? Is it DeVry? I don't know. It's probably DeVry. DeVry Diamond. From the first moment that his cellmate at the Millbank prison, Nat Cook, told him of the whereabouts. Desperate that the death of Jonathan Small, his partner in 1887, in the 1887 diamond theft, would lead to the dispersal or destruction of the Venus statues, Cook found himself forced to take on a new partner. Just two days after Small's death, Hawk was released from prison, where he had been serving two years for the burglary of a lady's jewelry box. He made straight for the home of Mrs. F Miss Violet Blue, having reassured himself of her devotion, he set about laying his plans. The next day, he went to Jay Small and Company to claim his prize, only to find that but five of the original 15 statues remained. He purchased them, and posing as a Southampton dealer in Objets Dart, Objects of Art, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, he learned from Mrs. Small where the other statues had been sold as a precaution, lest the bundles he now carried did not contain the treasure. He took them to Violet's room, where together they broke bundles in now carried... He now carried... Hold on. He they said they broke them in broke vain. Them to be, oh, that was the wrong line. To pieces in vain. Errol then plunged into devising a scheme to track down the others. The next morning, continues Holmes, drawing on his disreputable black bright... Briar. Yeah. Uh, Hawk went to the Evanson and Company gift shop where he purchased the last three Venuses still in stock and learned that the other two had been sold. Unable to convince the manager of the shop to reveal the names of the purchasers, he resolved to get this information by uh, reversing to his old trade of burglary. So we, you were right about that, that he did break in to figure out who had. Mm -hmm. yeah. Too late, though. He entered the shop that night and took down the names and addresses of Mrs. Oswald Mason and Mrs. Mabel Brown from the shop shipping register. Having spent the entire day plotting his actions, Hawk arrived at the Mason home in a state of considerable agitation. He entered through the upstairs bedroom window into a house he thought deserted until he saw the light in the study. He approached the door in much the way Mrs. Mason did upon her return. He saw Oswald Mason with his back to the door and the counterfeit Venus on the table in the far corner only a few steps away. At this point, Mr. Mason became aware of Hawk's presence, and a fight ensued that in, ended in Mason's death. After Hawk made sure that Mason was not going to give him any more trouble, he went to the corner table, grabbed the Venus, and smashed it on the floor. As he was sifting through the rubble of the broken statue, he heard the sound of the front door latch opening. 
Seeing that the diamonds were not in, Miss, in Mason's Venus, he saw no reason to prolong his stay. He opened the window, threw open the shutters, and slipped out, making his escape somewhat more noisily than was comfortable. Inspector Lestrade beams when Holmes adds, It thus would appear that Scotland Yard was correct in its conclusion that the killer had been surprised by Mrs. Mason's return. Lestrade mumbles something to himself, however, as Holmes continues, Unfortunately, they missed the obvious fact that well, it was only the Venus for which the burglar had come. With one murder done that evening, Hawk was not ready to let anything stand in his way of success and had made for Mrs. Mabel Brown's house. He climbed to the roof and in the pattern of entry which had made him a sus uh, such a spectacular menace to the fortunes of the wealthy matrons before his arrest, he gained access through a second story window. Mercifully, he found no one at home, and descending the stairs, he located Mabel Brown's facsimile of the Venus de Milo. Not wanting to see, be seen on the street at night carrying the thing, he smashed it there. Again, he had been foiled. One can only imagine the fury, lacking in remorse, which filled his heart at that moment. Holmes interrupts his narrative, can cast a contemptuous glance on the, at the now downcast hawk slumped against Lestrade beside the sobbing Miss Blue. As soon as the museum shop opened, Hawk was there and purchased the four pieces on the shelves and also learned the ominous fact that a fifth Venus de Milo had been sold only the day before. He had arrived back at Violet Blue's flat, but they were both tearing away at the wrapping and adding the statues one by one to the pile of plaster rubble by the grate. The diamonds, as you no doubt surmised, were in the second of the four museum copies. Once in possession of the stones, the two hurriedly completed the packing of their bags and then sped for Waterloo and the hope of a boat train and the freedom on the continent. Oh, my goodness. I need to say something, Dee, and mm -hmm. I really, I, I need you to hear this. Mm -hmm. If you had just trusted me and gone to Evanston & Co., mm -hmm. and we'd gone there early, mm -hmm. like I thought, mm -hmm. we could have gotten the name of, this, of the distributor, mm -hmm. gone to them... And then probably got on the trail of Hawk pretty early. But you didn't trust my judgment. Counterpoint. You were being ridiculous with your suggestions about Evans and Inco. You did not possibly. No, okay, legitimately, I thought they might have something to do with it because it was a break in. You thought that would be the best lead to follow up on first thing. Yeah, kind of. We should probably redeem ourselves at some the point. The innocent man and woman are dead because no, of that. No, no one's dead. All right, so here's how Holmes solved the case by following the following seven leads. He went first to the Mason home, which I believe we did. Mm -hmm. uh, then the Bank of England, which we definitely went to. Then Mabel Brown, which, which we, we eventually to. got to. Evanson & Co., which we eventually got to. But then Jay Small & Company. Which we never went to. No, Millbank Prison. Never went to. No, wouldn't even have thought of it. Violet Blue. Nope. His oh. score is 100 points. As it always we only, is. We only were 125 points behind him. No crown for us. The game gets the crown. It stays there. Well, you know, it happens sometimes. You don't always win in Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. Holmes wins, which is which all that really matters. Anyway, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, I uh, hope you did. Uh, please like, comment, subscribe, and share. I'm sure we'll be hearing some comments about how stupid we are, how terrible we are at investigating. If you are interested in us continuing this, there are, again, uh, three more cases left in this, including the titular Thames murder case. You know, let us know. We, uh, you mean Thames? Thames. Did I say Thames? You said Thames. It's embarrassing. Thames. Because that's how the English pronounce words. Exactly. Properly. And if you're interested in uh, you can check out our social media. Our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are uh, linked to below if you want to follow those so you know what's coming up down the pipeline. Uh, typically, we'd have a review coming out next Wednesday. Will, do you think we'll be talking about this at all or maybe we skip a week we'll probably do something maybe just talk about what we liked about this case I yeah or just the game i can talk more about the game in general yeah uh yeah so we'll see so it should be something coming up next wednesday uh but i think that's it for now thank you again for watching everybody until next time goodbye